Remember last week when I asked the question, I asked you, do you believe that uh, it's never going to benefit you to lie? Remember that? That it will never benefit. And I asked you whether you believe that or not. Uh, the next day on Monday, I was confronted and uh, a guy that was here says, hey, you know, I was thinking about what you said about, it. you know, it never benefits you to lie. And uh, he says, what about those times, though, when your wife says, how do I look in this outfit? <laughs> and I was like, ah, oh, I forgot about that, you know. <laughs> but no, 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 really, though, you know what? You know what I really believe about that? My first year of marriage, first year of marriage, you know, I've married almost 10 years now. And uh, first year of marriage, we, uh, it was around Christmas time. And uh, we're watching this Christmas show or something, and Mariah Carey comes on and does this Christmas video in this little Santa outfit thing, you know. And, uh, and my wife looks over at me and says, honey, do you think she's more attractive than I am? And I paused. I didn't even say anything yet. I just paused. And I was like, Rrr! you know, it was like, oh, you know. And, but, but here's the thing is, is you know, I, I go, wait, 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 hold on. She goes, you do, you do that, you know. I'm like, no, well, just hold, stop. This isn't fair, first of all. You know, you just got done taking all your makeup off and popping all your zits, you know. And, uh, you know. And she's on television, you know, all the lights and makeup and everything, and they make her look all perfect. I bet you if you brought her out of the TV right here and you put your makeup back on and did your hair up and everything else, I bet you I would find you more attractive than her. That wasn't good enough, you know. You know, and then, you know so then I go, well, wait a second. That's not, like if I asked you, hey, am I more attractive than Brad Pitt? And she goes, I think you are. I'm like, shut up, I'm not, I'm not, you can't say that, you know, I am not, you know, we got on this whole thing, but you know, through that, through that whole experience, you know, we, we both learned a lot about each other, but uh, one of the things, though, was that she learned that, you know what, I, I was going to be honest, and she knew that, even though I, I wouldn't always say the things that she would want to hear, and she learned that about me, and she learned not to ask certain questions, <laughs> and uh but through the years, I mean, that's been such an important part of our relationship is this honesty. I mean, like last night, last night I got done preaching here, you know, and, you know, and when I got home, I asked my wife, I go, hey, how did I sound tonight? And she was just totally honest with me and says, you know, you kind of rambled here and you kind of said this and then you switch gears here and it didn't really totally make sense. I don't think we were with you. And you gave this illustration that seemed to kind of come out of the blue. And I was like, wow, you know what? You're right. You're right. And, and, and she's the only one I trust to really tell the truth about me. And, and it was so helpful, you know, last night, go through my notes again, and hopefully I'll make sense today, and you'll like it. You know, but uh, it's just, it's that trust, you know, because I asked a couple of staff guys afterwards, you know, I asked Tony, hey, how was it? He goes, oh, it was great, give me a raise. You know, <laughs> my, uh, but, but to trust my wife and just say, you know, there's something about, an intimacy that develops because of that trust and because of that honesty. And I, can, I know that she's one of the very few people on this earth that will tell me the absolute truth about me. Not what I want to hear all the time, but she'll tell me the truth. And, and you can't trade that for anything in a relationship. You know, as, as we move beyond this issue of honesty that we've been talking about the last couple of weeks and move beyond this issue of hypocrisy, you know, some of you may think, oh, okay, good. We're not going to talk about honesty anymore, you know, I can, you know, and I, I won't be convicted this week about all the lies in my life. You know, that's not true. You see, because just because I'm not talking about it anymore doesn't mean you won't be convicted. Because the Bible says that that's the Holy Spirit's job. The Holy Spirit's job is to convict you of your sin. And uh, in the weeks to come, even though I don't speak about honesty, it'll be, still be on your heart. Because that's what he does. The Bible says he makes us a slave to what is right, a slave to righteousness. And so when we're not living the lives we, we ought to be living, the Holy Spirit convicts us in those areas to where we can't rest till we get them right. And my prayer is just that, you know, so many of you have come clean and just gotten real with what's really going on in your life. And I pray that we'd all do that. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about the Holy Spirit this week. In fact, the next passage in, in Luke is about the Holy Spirit. And, and as I looked at it, I thought, man, I can't say everything I want to say about the Holy Spirit in one week. And so after this week, my next two messages are going to be the whole, on the Holy Spirit because I, I just feel like uh, I just know that we don't talk about the Holy Spirit enough. Um, and, and not that we can, 
but but you get this jesus said imagine this because this is still one of the things that still boggles my mind jesus said to his disciples when he left the earth before he left the earth he pulls his disciples aside and he says listen it is to your advantage that i go away he says that in john 16. it's to your advantage that i go away i mean think about that for a second how in the world could it be to their advantage that Jesus leave the earth? These are the people that have been walking side by side with Jesus for about three years at this point. And Jesus says, it's to your advantage that I go away. I mean, can you imagine if you, you actually literally walked with Jesus in the flesh? Yet yeah, Jesus walking around with you every day. Can you imagine what an advantage that would be? To have the Son of God walking next to you going, I know what you're thinking. Oh, okay, right. You know, I mean, just <laughs> constantly, just right there, teaching you, discipling you. So after all that experience the disciples had, then Jesus says, hey, it's to your advantage that I go away. That must have been so confusing. But then he says in the next breath, because unless I go, the helper cannot come. And explains that when he goes back to heaven, he's going to send the Holy Spirit. And that they're going to be better off with the Holy Spirit than having Jesus right there by their side. See, when you look at it in those terms and you think about how helpful it would be to have Jesus walking next to you. And for him to say it's to your advantage is even better. Better than having me next to you is the Holy Spirit living in you. It starts to make us wonder, okay, well, then I must not really get the Holy Spirit as much as I should. I must not really be filled with the Holy Spirit as much as I should be um, because it's, I don't think of him daily. Whereas I would think about Jesus being right next to me. I would see his power. I'd experience his power. Do I experience that with the Holy Spirit? A lot of times in the conservative churches, we, uh, we tend to neglect this issue. You know, we, we look at some of the radicals, you know, and some of the things they do supposedly by the Holy Spirit, and it just kind of scares us. You know, rather than realizing, no, there's some absolute truth in Scripture about the Holy Spirit that we need to understand, and that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, but, but, you know, you remember how last week's message, it was like terrifying on the one hand, because we talked about the fear of God, and, and, you know, about Him being able to cast someone into hell forever. And yet right afterwards, in the next breath, Jesus talks about how comforting that father is because he has every hair on our head numbered. And so in one minute you're terrified, and the next minute it's like, oh, this is great. He does the same thing with the Holy Spirit here. He just gives, gives this terrifying uh, statement about how if we ever blaspheme the Holy Spirit that we will never be forgiven. Did you realize that? Did you realize that there's a sin that will never be forgiven? See, we always talk about how you'll be forgiven for everything, you'll be forgiven for everything, everything but there's one sin the Bible describes that we will not be forgiven of if we've committed it. And it's in Luke chapter 12, verse 10, <coughs> where Jesus says, And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Okay, you read that, and that, that's pretty intense. You think, okay, well, did I commit it? Have I committed it? So there's something that I won't be forgiven of, and then I will have to pay for it for all of eternity? Is it possible? What is that sin? To understand that sin, it's all about context. You've got to understand the context in which Jesus made the statement. That's why we read the, the Bible verse by verse through, you know, throughout you know, these books. Look at chapter 12. Look at verse 1. What, what's the first word of ch chapter 12, verse 1? Meanwhile, or, or something like that. Meanwhile, in the Greek, it literally is in such circumstances or in these circumstances. Okay, very important because you understand that in the midst of those circumstances, Jesus gives this discourse in chapter 12. Now, what circumstances is he talking about? You have to go back to chapter 11. In chapter 11, what happens there is that's when Jesus performs that miracle where he casts out the demon. Remember that? He cast the demon out of the guy. And, and what do the Pharisees say about this miracle? They say he did that by the power of Beelzebul or Satan. 
And it's in that context that Jesus warns his disciples, look, everything's going to be forgiven, but not blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, this is what it is. It is when you see an undeniable miracle by the power of the Holy Spirit and you choose to attribute it to Satan. Okay? This is an undeniable, unmistakable miracle. The point is, is the Pharisees knew that that was of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't like one of those miracles, well, he could have done it other ways. They knew it was a miracle of the Holy Spirit, and they chose to attribute it to Satan. And at that point, Jesus says, you can't be forgiven of that. In fact, if you have your Bibles, turn back a couple of, uh, or no, one book, to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 3. This may clarify more, because this is the exact same story in the book of Mark, and, and Mark records it, <coughs> and listen to how he presents it. Mark 3, starting in verse 28. Mark 3, verse 28, he says this, I tell you the truth, all the sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven them, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven he is guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an evil spirit. Okay, so Mark makes it very clear. Why was Jesus saying this? Because the Pharisees claimed that Jesus did it by the power of, a holy, of, 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 of an evil spirit. They saw a miracle of the Holy Spirit, and they said, no, he did it by an evil spirit. He did it by Satan. He drives it out by Beelzebul. Now, a couple things I want you to notice there in Mark, first of all, uh, that, uh, that he says in verse 28, all the sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven them. Okay? All your sins, all your blasphemy of the past, that will all be forgiven. The only thing that won't be forgiven is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And, and I say that because I know some of you come from religions where you were taught there were certain sins that are categorized where uh, you won't be forgiven of those. That's a lie. It's an absolute lie. It goes absolutely against everything Scripture teaches. Jesus himself says right there, it doesn't matter who told you differently, all your sins can be forgiven, except for blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, but everything else. So if you've, been, if you've been holding on to things from your childhood and wondering if you've been forgiven of them or you could be forgiven of them, God says right there, Jesus Christ says, look, all those sins can be forgiven. Okay, so let go of that. Okay, Jesus died for that on the cross. He already paid the penalty for it. But this issue of, of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, it says that it's an eternal sin. And then that person will never be forgiven for all of eternity. He'll be punished for that. Now that sounds harsh, doesn't it? Seems like, well, why would he say that? Why, why would there be a sin that's so bad that he'll never be forgiven? Here's the real point. I, I really believe this is the point of it. The point is, is what else could God have done for them? Okay, this is what it comes down to. What more could God have done for the Pharisees? Think about it. God not only sends his son down to them to speak and show his life by these miracles, but then he sends the Holy Spirit and he performs a, a miracle. God shows his power to this group of people and says, watch, look, let me prove to you that I'm the Son of God. You know, as the Holy Spirit come and perform this miracle in their sight to where these Pharisees saw and they knew it was a miracle of God. And at that point, even though God had given them the Son, given them the Holy Spirit, after all of that, they still say, no, we don't believe it, you're of Satan. And it's at that point, what, honestly, think, what more could God have done Nothing. It's, it's the point when God has done everything to reach this person, that person still attributes it to Satan, then he says, that's it. You, you can't be forgiven. You, you'll never reach repentance. I've shown you everything I can. You still refuse to repent. There's nothing left for you except for judgment. And I really believe that's the thrust of that. You know, so we don't worry. Don't, don't. Some people take this out of context and they go, well, you know, sometimes people say they do things out of the power of the Holy Spirit, and I question it. You know, you ever have that happen where someone said they did something by the power of the Holy Spirit, and you watch it, and you go, oh, I don't know. 
And then you think of this verse and you go, but I don't want to blaspheme it, so maybe I just need to accept it and say, yeah, it's of the Holy Spirit. You know, like if you're watching TV and, and someone on the television comes up, you know, to a TV preacher and he goes, yeah, this one arm's always been longer than the other. Can you heal me? You know, see? You know, and then the guy touches him and he goes, I feel something, I feel something. I go, Woo! You know, and they start jumping around and you watch it and you go, I don't really buy it. You know, but you're scared. You go, am I blaspheming the Holy Spirit? That's not blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. The Bible even commands us to test the spirits, to discern and really go, you know, is that really him? Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is not that. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is only when there is an undeniable miracle of the Holy Spirit, when there's something that, that isn't mistaken, that you can't question and go, well, I don't know if that's real or not. It's when you know it's real and you've seen the Holy Spirit and you've seen that power and you know it's a miracle of his and you choose to attribute it to Satan. That is the impardonable sin. But we are called to be discerning. We're called to, 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 to observe our own doctrine in our lives closely. And a lot of times, you know, when we're discerning other people and whether their ministries are for real, it's important to look at their lives and look at their doctrine. Look at how they're living. Do they really live like Jesus lived? You know, do, you know look at the, what they're saying. Are they really teaching the very words of God? We're called to discern that. And I really think that's why Jesus says, Anyone who blasphemes the Son of Man can be forgiven, or anyone speaks a word against me. When he says the Son of Man, the Son of Man was an Old Testament term referring to the Messiah that was going to come. So whenever Jesus claimed to be the Son of Man, the Jewish mindset knew immediately he's referring to himself as the Messiah. And Jesus says to them, now you can blaspheme the Son of Man. You can speak against me, and that can be forgiven of you. Okay, and, I, and, and the reason is, is it's, it's understandable that a person studying the Old Testament could not believe initially that Jesus were the Messiah. And the reason is this. In the Old Testament, you've got a lot of passages that talk about this one that's going to come, the Messiah, since the beginning of time, since Adam and Eve it was prophesied that this one would come. But many of these prophecies talk about him as this powerful ruler that's going to come and set up this awesome kingdom on the earth okay and that's why you hear the disciples you know throughout the life going when are you going to set up your kingdom when are you going to do it and they're all thinking that he's going to come and take over the world see but the thing is is in the old testament there are also other passages that talk about this one that is going to come and be cut off the anointed one in daniel 9 that's going to come and then he's going to be cut off and have nothing it talks about Isaiah 53, this one that's going to be pierced through for our transgressions. It talks about this one that's going to actually take our sin upon him and that by his wounds we were going to be healed. It talks about this one that was going to come humbly and mounted on a donkey. And so the mindset would be, well, the Messiah, he's going to come, he's going to be this powerful man. Yeah, but there's also these other passages that talk about him coming as this, this suffering servant. And it's like, well, which one do I believe? And yet at that time, because most of the passages talk about him as a ruler, that's all they thought about. He's going to come. He's going to be powerful. So you see Jesus come, die on a cross, weak, you know, not weak, but humble, and spit upon, allowing these people to step all over him. And you go, that couldn't have been the Messiah. You see how it would have been very easy to blaspheme him and go, no, no, like, you, you're, not, you're not the Son of God. The Son of God's going to come or the Messiah is going to come and he's going to set up this, this kingdom. See, we have the advantage of looking in hindsight and going, oh, now I get it. That's why there are these different passages, because he's going to come and suffer and be cut off, as the scriptures say, but then he returns and he's going to set up his kingdom. And so now we can put the two together and say, well, that's how he can die and also rule, is because he does both and there's a second coming. But I don't, I don't believe you could have really gotten that from just studying the Old Testament. Um, that the Old Testament saint could understand that there were two comings, I don't believe so. And uh, in, in fact, there are some who say, yeah, it's hard for me to believe in Jesus because he claimed to be the Son of God. And nowhere in the Old Testament does it teach that the Messiah was going to be the Son of God. And it may not say that specifically, but there are clues. I mean, look at Isaiah chapter 9. In the Old Testament, in Isaiah chapter 9, in verse 6, it's, it's that verse that we read... Uh, during Christmas time, but I want you to look at the significance of it. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 says this For unto us 
a child is born. <coughs> to us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You see that? It says this child's going to be born that's going to be called Mighty God. And he's going to be called Everlasting Father. You see, because it, it would be, it would be very confusing to a, a Jewish person who studies Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, their great command is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. The Lord your God is one. And so in your mind, you're saying, no, there's one God, there's one God. Then these Christians come along and say, no, oh, you know, there's this Trinity and this and that. And it's like, well, how can I believe that Jesus was also God? Well, I think it's from the, your, the very Old Testament that says, you know, while it doesn't flat out just say it clearly, it gives us this clue that this child is going to be born that's going to be called Everlasting Father. And it shows some sort of oneness between this child and the Everlasting Who's the Everlasting Father? God the Father. And yet the child's going to be called that. And it gives us a clue into this, this unity between the Son and the Father to where the Son can be called Everlasting Father and be called Mighty God. Look, you don't call anyone Mighty God except for God himself. And yet this child that's going to be born is going to be called that. You, you see, again, all this stuff is easier to see now in hindsight, but to them it would have been confusing. And so people will blaspheme Jesus. Jesus says, you know, people are going to blaspheme me. They're going to, they're going to question me. They're going to speak against me. And that's one thing. He goes, but when you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, that's different. Because that is God revealing himself to you in an unmistakable way. And he shows you his Holy Spirit. And at that point, if you at that point see this unmistakable miracle of God through the power of the Holy Spirit and you deny it, there's nothing more God can do for you. And that's why it's an eternal sin. It's an eternal punishment. So hopefully you understand that. And then after Jesus makes that statement, he moves on to really, you guys, I, I've always known this next verse, but I just wonder if I really believed it. Um, because if I did, gosh, this would bring so much comfort to me. You see, you see, look at the next verse, verse 11. He says, when you are brought before synagogues, rulers, <coughs> and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. Do you believe that? About yourself. See, Jesus tells his disciples, look, you're going to go up against, you know, the synagogue leaders, you know, people of a different faith. You're going to go up against people that are rulers, governors, authorities. And he says... Don't worry. Don't worry when you come up to those people about how you're going to defend your faith. You ever worried about how you were going to share your faith with someone? You ever got intimidated by someone like, oh, they know too much. I don't know enough to talk to them. See, this passage says, don't you worry when you go up in front of them because the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. It doesn't say he's going to tell you ahead of time what to say. And that's the annoying part. You know, we want to know ahead of time. We don't like this faith thing. We don't like this, okay, God's going to just have to have the words come out of my mouth. We don't like that. But God promises that. And he uses that to comfort them. Look, the Spirit of God lives in you. That means anytime you are called to defend your faith or say something or speak up about God, you'll be able to say what needs to be said. Now, the promise there doesn't promise that you're going to win the argument, does it? A lot of times that's our, you know, that's our pride. This is, oh, I got to win, I got to do this or that, or I got to lead in the Lord. No, it just says that you'll be able to say what needs to be said, that the Holy Spirit will give you at that time what you need to say, that somehow your words will impact that person you're speaking to. This is so important because many of us don't speak up because, because of fear. I don't know enough. I hear that all the time. I don't know enough. And yet, what does that say? He's going to teach you what to say. It may not be enough to win an argument, but you'll say what God once said. Do you believe that? I mean, really? 
Because a lot of us, we will only talk to people that we know we're uh, intellectually superior to, you know, and we'll get intimidated by certain people. Like, I don't know enough to talk to him, and so we end up talking to all these kindergartners. And, uh, <laughs> you know, because why? We're relying on ourselves, and we don't really believe that God's going to give me the right words to say. And the simplicity of a new believer saying something you don't know how it's going to touch them. See, because the point is, you guys, the Bible is so clear. This is not about flesh and blood. It's about a spiritual warfare. It's not about us and our intellect and us always knowing more. Now, definitely, we are called to study, 2 Timothy 2.15. We're called to study so that we're not ashamed of our knowledge. But in the end, it's not about knowledge. It's not about what the world teaches about flesh and blood, but there's something spiritual that takes place, and that God, through his spirit, can cause you to say something that that person needs to hear at that moment. But do you believe that something supernatural will happen in your life when you just speak up and start talking about God? Because God promises that. See, that's where I say, you know what, do we really believe in the Holy Spirit? To where we have that type of confidence. I remember in, uh, in high school, someone taught and, and, uh, and said, successful evangelism is taking the initiative to share Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results to God. That's all it comes down to. Successful evangelism is just taking the initiative to share Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit and then just leaving the results to God. You do that and you've succeeded. You've done what God wants you to do. Doesn't mean you, you, you know every answer. Doesn't mean that you won. Doesn't mean you even necessarily led this person to the Lord. It just means you took the initiative. And you just started speaking in the power of the Holy Spirit and God will give you words to say and then you're done. That's successful in God's eyes. You know, uh, <laughs> I have my high school yearbook with me today. <laughs> This week, I, I looked at it. I, I just, uh, you know, we were cleaning it up a few, you know, a couple months ago as we were moving and saw my high school yearbooks. And, you know, and I thought, yeah, I'm just going to look at one one of these days. You know, and I haven't read this since I graduated. So it's been 18 years since I graduated high school. Let me, let me put you in the mood of my high school years, okay? Um, if, you'll, if you'll look up on the screen. <laughs> Aww. Is that hilarious? I used to always look at, you know, like old people's, you know, old yearbook pictures and go, wow, you used to look like that. Look at that hair. <laughs> oh, what a good looking guy. Anyways, <laughs> oh, it's just so funny. It's like, wow, he looks so goofy. I still do. But, uh, you know, I started reading some of the things that people wrote. You know how at the end of the year, everyone signs your yearbook and stuff like that. I just want to read a couple to you because I, I it's interesting, you know, you read some of them and you, you see a name and you go, who is that? And you have to look him up. And, oh, okay, now I remember him. And stuff like that. All these people that you said you're going to be best friends with forever, it never happens. If you're in high school and you have friends go, we'll be friends forever, you won't. Um, <laughs> it just doesn't. You know, you have all these people that you think you're going to keep in touch with. They all say, what, K-I-T, keep in touch. <laughs> you never call them. Um, but... So many, you know, there was some really significant things written in. There's others, you know, that just, you, it was like, wow, we really didn't know each other. But there were so many entries in this yearbook that people wrote that sounded the same. And uh, I just want to read some of them. It, you know, Francis, it's been a pleasure being your friend for the past four years. I must admit, you're even funnier than I am. Good luck in the future, Todd. Francis, it's hard to believe it's over. After elementary school, we've made it to our senior year. You've made me laugh so much. You're a great guy. Best wishes. Take care, Mike. What a fun three years. Thank you for all the fun times we had that you, Ken, and I had together. Well, I hope we can be friends till we're old and gray. <laughs> Never saw him again after he wrote this. <laughs> Good luck in the future. Keep telling stupid jokes. <laughs> this one's funny. Francis, you're a real good friend even though you are not from this country. <laughs> and then he goes on. But I know, but I know that myself and all my native friends think you're a real nice guy. <laughs> Good luck in the future. I can tell 
that you will do really well, but be careful and don't think that you are too funny because I am still funnier than you. Have a good summer, have a great future, keep in touch. I mean, so many of them are just these goofy, you know, hey, it's been fun. You know, people that I knew since elementary school of, man, you just made me laugh so much, this or that, I'm funnier than you, you're funnier than me, whatever. You know, just, and I think about high school and just how many times, you know, just in the middle of class just laughing, you know, just laughing my head off, you know, or, or making people laugh. And, and then I, I look back and I go, what really matters now? And you ever think about that? You know, I looked at all those relationships and that image I was so concerned about you know, and wanting to be, you know, the likable guy and the funny guy and the guy that was fun to hang around with. And I look at it now, 18 years later, I go, how much of that really matters to me now? The stuff that I was so preoccupied with, it just doesn't matter. And the only entries in this book that I really care about is every once in a while I'd read about someone who, who wrote in here, you know, you're the one that helped me understand God. You're the one that, that, that showed me what a, what a Christian was. And it's like, wow, that's really cool. Something that actually mattered. I actually did something that mattered in high school when so much of it was a waste. And, and the thing is, is, is hopefully we learn from that. We can go, well, none of that matters to me anymore. The only thing that mattered was whatever impact I had for God. Because what happens, we'll start living with more and more regret through all our lives because we go, well, I wish I had said something to that person because I was never going to see him again anyways. That was my last chance. Why didn't I say something? Why didn't I say something that could have been eternal? I, I'd be still thrilled about that if I had. And you look at all those relations and go, man, what a waste. And what if we got a yearbook from every job we ever had? You know? And where everyone that worked there with you says, wow, it's been great here at Taco Bell, you know. <laughs> you're a great burrito maker, have a great life, you know. I mean, I mean, honestly, what would they say about you? Would it have been trivial? Oh, you were funny, it was so funny when this happened or that happened. Because let me, let me translate a lot of these for you. Basically what they're saying is we had a good time, but I'll never remember you and you had no impact on my life. And that's really what it comes down to. And that's the truth about many of the neighborhoods we've lived in. If they had a yearbook, it's like, oh, yeah, I remember. Yeah, you were a good neighbor. Your lawn was always green. Good luck at your next house. Hope you can make it even greener. You know, I mean, really, that's, that's the extent to many of our relationships, and we've got to admit it. It's shallow, and a lot of times it's because of fear, because we don't want to speak up. And you know what? One day we're going to have a memorial service for each of us. For some of us, that will be this year. It will be our memorial service. And you know what? it'll be the final yearbook signing where everyone comes up and says, oh yeah, I remember this, 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 this. Anything important though? Anything that's gonna matter? I, I've done a lot of memorial services and there are those when there's just nothing to be said. Little trivial things that won't matter. Then there's others where it's like, wow, that person's life just radically impacted people. People coming up left and right talking about how they will be eternally impacted by that person's life, by the way she lived. She was the first believer that, that, that I, I saw that really lived it out and was honest and real with me. You know, what are you headed for? Are you headed for more just, you know, yearbook, you know, statements at your memorial service? Keep in touch. Have a great summer. Or are you making a difference? See, it's all about the Holy Spirit working through you. It's usually at this time that I have a conclusion that I've kind of thought through that I'll share, but in light of the passage, I thought, you know what, God, just give me something to say to each service that's completely different at that time. Because I have no idea what I'm going to say right now. Just every service has been different. Just saying, God, you know what, just have me teach something from the scriptures, some truth that's unique to each service at that time. You know, when God created us, he ordained every day of our lives. He knew how long we were going to live. I don't know it. I don't know when I'm going to die. It could be this year. It could be 50 years from now. Who knows? The whole point of me being here is to have some sort of impact. It's not to take up space. It's not just to have a fun, happy family. It's not just to make people laugh and have them like me. Because I won't care about any of that in the end. In the end, what's going to matter is who
who did I impact? When did I just speak up for Jesus? So I can think of times when I got scared, I got intimidated, and I just kept my mouth shut. And a lot of people do that. It's, it's, it's an easy thing to do. Even the great prophets, you know, when God called Moses, what did Moses say? I can't talk. And God says, who made your mouth? What do you mean you can't talk? You know? When he called Jeremiah in chapter 1, he says, you know, go say this. He says, I can't talk. I'm just a child. And he says, don't say you're just a child. I'm going to speak through you. Let me speak through you. Say what I tell you to say. And you guys, that's all that's going to matter in the end. Man, I have, I have regret over the times I've chickened out. Serious regret over times when I've chickened out. And, and we don't want to just build a lifetime of regrets where we never get it and we never figure it out that, wow, I had the Holy Spirit in me and I could have just said what needed to be said at that moment. Do you have that type of faith as you leave today? That God really dwells inside of you? And that when it's time for you to speak that supernaturally words will just come out of your mouth that God wants spoken? That's pretty intense. That I've got the Spirit of God living in me and that right now I'm saying the very things that God in heaven wants to say to you. And this, that's an intense thought. And that, that this week, you know, that there will be opportunities for you to do the same thing and just start talking. You ever, you ever leave church sometimes and think that I followed you around all week because I was just speaking directly to you? I hear that all the time. You guys, that's the Holy Spirit. It's the fact that I, I'll say things that I even plan on saying. Why? For that specific service because God wanted to say something to you. Man, and it's not unique to me. That's the Spirit of God that dwells in all of us. And what if we all took that seriously and really believed that we were God's instrument and that His Spirit really dwelt through us and we were His mouth? Man, what an incredible impact we would have on this world. See, stop saying you don't know enough. Okay? Keep studying and everything else, but stop saying you don't know enough. You know what you need to know. Stop saying you don't have the words because... God will give you the words. You don't have them right now, but you will. That's what faith is all about. And if we could just keep that in mind this week, what an impact we could have this very week. Don't waste another week in life. Some of you maybe even, uh, <coughs> you've never even publicly confessed your faith in Jesus through baptism. You know that that's a command of God. That's something God's called you to. Don't. Don't go home today with regret. Don't, don't sit in your room this afternoon and go, I should have got baptized. But just, just do what God's called you to do. Don't go through your life with all these regrets of I should have gotten honest, I should have confessed, I should have, should have, should have. You know, it's a terrible way to live life. Just do what God's Spirit is leading you to do this week.